I think we should begin uh, because we have the top of the hour and some people are showing up and we have guests here live in the Educause studio. So to begin, hello, uh, to begin, welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, I'm delighted to see some of you here today. I'm delighted to be here in this unusual location. We're here at the Educause International Conference in Chicago, Illinois. And if we get a hello from the crowd around us, say something. <laughs> Awesome. Why don't you turn your camera around so people can see it? Just grab a laptop and see who. Yeah, you can see all those people there. So this is one of those special sessions where we combine the virtual and the physical, the digital and the analog, the global online, and the intimate face-to-face. -face. Uh, so before we do all that, let me just introduce the program and explain how it works, what it's about, what we hope to accomplish, and then we'll start off with a whole bunch of conversations. So to start off with, uh, the Future Trends Forum is a conversation-based program where we have discussions about the future of higher education. Unlike your typical webinar, we don't have any slides. What you're seeing right here is just the introduction. Instead, we are all about back and forth, about questions, about exchanges, and about sharing information and knowledge. Um, the idea here is to collaboratively grapple with higher education's future. And we've been doing this now for almost eight years. And when I say we, uh, I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and your chief cat herder for the next hour of conversation. Now, if you want to learn more about the forum, we have a lot of stuff online, including an archive going back, again, nearly eight years. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive, and you can find uh, nearly 400 recordings of sessions. In fact, if you go to our website, forum.futureofeducation.us, you can find uh, a whole a table of contents of looking at our sessions as we cover everything from learning management system to copyright to presidents to leadership and more. Now, if you want to see what we're coming up with, next, over the next few weeks, we have sessions coming up on a wide range of subjects, including information literacy, new developments there, intermediary organizations, uh, organizations that are neither corporate nor academic and how they can help academia. And we also have uh, another session on the changing landscape of higher online education. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more about that. Now we can only do this work with the help of some generous sponsors. I'd like to thank them before we proceed. NizerNet in New York State. Actually, NizerNet has some representatives here. I hope they get to see this. Uh, they are a nonprofit that does great work getting all kinds of colleges and universities online and doing great professional development work with them. We're grateful for them for their support. And we're grateful to Shindig because if you're new here or if you haven't been involved in Shindig for a while, it works pretty interestingly. Um, what we have in the top half of the screen is the stage. We call it that because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on on stage. And we also have the bottom half of the screen, everybody else. So all around you, you should see different logins for different people. In fact, if you want to get to know more about them, just mouse over them and you can see more. And if you'd like to meet somebody that is on our program, just double click on them. And if they want to talk to you, your two icons can snap together like Legos, which is pretty cool. But how do you participate in this overall conversation? Well, there are a few ways. And on the mobile app, you should be able to see some buttons for this. And on your web, you should be able to scroll down to the bottom of the screen and see a white band running along it with a few different buttons. One of those buttons is a number. When you press that, you get a chat box. And people use the chat box all the time. In fact, if you haven't said hello in the chat box, say hello. Um, let me say hello from Chicago right now. Now, next to that chat box um, on the white strip are a couple other buttons. One of them is a raised hand. Uh, and that, if you click that, that tells me you want to join us on stage, which is easy to do. And next to that is a Q&A box into which you can type a question, and I'll flash that question up on the stage when the time is right. So those are the ways to participate, and we're grateful to the Shindig for making them available. Last but definitely not least, we're grateful to our supporters on Patreon who contribute as, I mean, some of these guys contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep all our lights on, our machines happy, and the rest of them contribute $10 or more a month. Folks like Phil Long, like David Adel, like Chris Sessoms, we're really grateful to them for their support. And you can join them. Just go to Brian, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. Now today, we are at the Educause Conference in Chicago, Illinois. We are on the third day of an event, of lots of sessions, lots of conversations, lots of discussion. And we're in this great spot where we're in a wonderful studio run by the great Jerry Bain. And around us are a couple of dozen people who are here to talk to you and to answer your questions. Uh, or just to listen and see what's going on. 
Uh, so to start with, I'd like to bring to the stage our good friend and splendidly mustachioed man, uh, Thomas J. Tobin. Uh, Tom does, among other things, uh, he works remotely from Pennsylvania, where he uh, works at the University of Wisconsin. He consults widely. He writes a lot. He's like a one-man army. And I'm going to bring him up here so that we can share some notes. And the idea here is to connect the physical conference with the virtual. Hello, Tom. And hello, Brian. Good to join you from EDUCAUSE today. Welcome, friends who are joining us here at the EDUCAUSE conference and those of you who are online joining us for this special episode. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Glad to see you. Uh, if I could quickly uh, get a quick uh, sound check, can those of you uh, hear us? Tom says there's a little echo. Let's see. Did that take care of what I'm yeah, it looks like I'm coming through and you are as well. Very good. Very good. So, and uh, just for the people online, uh, we'll do this wave again. I'm going to turn my camera out here. And uh, those of you here, wave hello to your friends who are online in the session as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. So what I was hoping to do, Tom, was to ask you a couple of things. First, you were presenting a really, really great poster. I'd like to hear about it. But also, I want to hear about your experience here at Educause. What have you been seeing? What have you been hearing? So let's start off with your poster. What was it about? Uh, I presented some research that's going toward the new book that I'm writing called uh, Universal Design for Learning at Scale. Mm. I'm working with 11 different colleges and universities in the United States and Canada to take what had been up until now, largely an individual effort. Here's how instructors can use the framework of universal design for learning in order to lower barriers for their students. But when we're doing that in individual sessions or individual applications, I'm working with colleges and universities to help scale that up to entire institutions. And so I, I presented on that. I was grateful that a lot of people stopped by. And uh, listeners, if your college or university is anywhere along that journey, I'd love to hear from you as well and perhaps feature your ideas in the book. Well, I have to ask a couple of questions about that. One is when we think about universal design for learning, we often think about accessibility. Uh, how important are accessibility offices or departments to this measure? Uh, accessibility offices, A, pay them more money and hire more staff for yours, period. And the folks who are doing disability support and accessibility support work in our colleges and universities, they are doing one change one time for one person. They are helping people to make accommodations. So these are students who have documented disability conditions in their environment, and they're helping lower those barriers one at a time. Now, what I want to advocate for is universal design for learning, which goes hand in hand with the work that our colleagues in disability support offices are doing. That work is how to think about the learning interactions that our students have with materials, with each other, with us, with support staffers, with the community. If all of those interactions, if we're designing them so that there's more than one way to take advantage of them, then we're, then we're barriers not only for students with disabilities, but also students who have work, have work and family responsibility, live far, live far away from campus, or they just happen to be on their mobile device yeah. instead of using more robust technology. What that, what that does, does is by lowering, is by lowering those barriers, barriers more broadly, we're actually, we're actually making more time for our colleagues in the disability service offices to spend, to spend more concentrated time with the students who need their help the most. So, so what we're doing is we're helping them focus more on their, their mission while, while we're also making it a little smoother and a little easier, easier, easier not only for our students, students but also for us as instructors, as administrators, as support staffers at colleges and universities. So on the one hand, you're increasing efficiency, both at an institutional level and a personal level. You're improving the experience that the students get and the, the quality of their learning and their outcomes. And you're also at the same time doing what they sometimes call the curb cut principle, which is if you make a, a, an accommodation for disability, it can also benefit people who are not in that disability category. Well, well summarized, yes. yes. Oh, this is excellent. Uh, this is a terrific work, and we look forward to your book. Thank you. When it comes out, let me know so we can bring you back just to talk about that. Uh, what kind of feedback did you get, speaking of feedback, uh, from all the audiences that screened past your poster? Uh, folks, are folks are interested in it, and by the given this talk, 
long talk of poster five years ago, many, many people would not have known what universal design for what is. UDL was one of the EDUCAUSE uh, top 10 issues just before the pandemic. So in, in 2019, wow. accessibility, uh, accessibility and universal design and universal design for learning made it into EDUCAUSE top 10. And a lot of people now know about know the concept. concept. So people so are interested to learn more, more about how they can scale up because the big, one of the big themes at EDUCAUSE this year is scaling up our efforts and increasing the efficiency of what we're doing collectively in lots, lots of different areas of colleges and universities. It's interesting. I had realized that um, about the that current issue for EDUCAUSE. Uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, Tom Haynes has a really good comment. Uh, he says that the uh, uh, if you're smart in your design, ADA, for those of you outside the U.S., that's the American Disabilities Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA concerns usually fade into the background. Uh, for instance, he says, since I don't give tests, uh, you don't have to worry about affording extended times and all those sorts of things. Uh, that sounds like a really good point, Tom. Thank you. Well, to, to carry this transition on a bit, if, uh, as, as you walk around the conference, what are some of the other themes and ideas that you're hearing about as you've got hallways and as you've been to sessions, that kind of thing? Absolutely. I'm, I'm hearing three big things here at the EDUCAUSE conference. Um, first, first off, stocks are back. All of the vendors in the exhibition hall uh, are giving out uh, little swag items and things like that. And for the last few years, there's been a notable lack of free stocks. But everybody's got a pair of socks for you here from the vendor area. So that's, 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 theme, that's theme number one. Uh, and to be more serious, though, the big theme on everybody's lips today is generative artificial intelligence, generative AI. Um, many people were involved in artificial intelligence and large language models from a research perspective over the past many years. But it was only until November 23rd of 2022 when ChatGPT got released that suddenly it's on every administrator's mind. How are we going to respond? And we're just now coming out of the, oh, this is neat and it has so much possibility and working through the emotions of a ban and block and what do we do with it and how do we Make, make ethical use of large language models and, and chat GPT and, and generative AI. So there's a huge theme in lots and lots of uh, sessions and even sessions that aren't nominally about generative AI. People are putting it into their, their thought processes. Well, that's interesting. I mean, in, in my session on generative AI, we thought it was possible that one outcome that we might right now be in an interstitial stage. Um, we're passing from the pre-generative AI into the post-generative AI stage, in which case AI will be ubiquitous. Uh, and now we're having bumps and scrapes because it's brand new for us right now. Absolutely. So generative AI, socks, and one more thing. One more thing. And the, the one more thing, uh, in all of the conversations I've had with folks who are CIOs or in the information technology space, the other concern is about budgets. Collectively in higher education, we're seeing an enrollment cliff. Uh, we don't have as many students coming to our colleges and universities as before. And uh, you know, unless we are the Ivies with gigantic endowments, the majority of colleges and universities in North America, we're feeling a pinch and we're having to figure out where we can go in order to figure out efficiencies, uh, work with smaller budgets, uh, make, make consortia, consortia, those kinds of things. Uh, from, from the stage, stage today, we had the EDUCAUSE top 10 session from the Susan Project, and she eloquently uh, summarized some of that research that the folks at EDUCAUSE have been doing and talking about how worldwide we're seeing that trend of how do we do more with less. in straight circumstances. And so those two trends put together are a little bit, a little bit, a little bit challenging. Um, the big AI wave and fewer resources. You bet. Um, I've, I've got to say, Tom, I, I could talk to you forever, um, and but I've, I've taken you out of your session. Uh, let me thank you for coming. Uh, tell everybody, what's the number? I'm sure how do we find it? 
Uh, that was poster 508. I don't know uh, which wag in Educause gave me the uh, same section of the law that deals with disabilities from section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, but it's easy to remember. So if you're uh, on the Educause website and you want to see the materials from the session, just, you can search by my name under the conference session. So, thanks for having me on the show again. It's a pleasure, pleasure to talk with you. Oh, Take care. Thank you for doing the great work. You, you bet. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and uh, while Tom goes off, let me bring up another guest. Um, so you have to imagine that all around us, we're seeing all kinds of people uh, going back and forth. This is kind of like a grand presentation here. Um, and it's, uh, it's good to see all kinds of people here. Um, so just a quick show to say hello. If you could all yell back a hello at us. Hello! Some of, them are kind of, some of them are on their way to Starbucks, so there might be some, uh, might be some more uh, caffeine for this. Uh, but let me bring two people up here um, who are wonderful guests, one of whom I know very well, one of whom I don't know. So I'm calling him a wonderful guest. Now that the challenge is going to have to be wonderful. Um, you, you know what? You can sneak in any time. You know, I just found out you open a door. And, you know. and we have no idea who this guy literally came in from off the street. Um, we were just talking about accessibility. Universal design for learning a bit about AI, about financial projections. Now let's talk about another topic in order to introduce my good friend Lisa Stephens. Lisa is in Bigger Buffalo right now, right? I am. Uh, where she's, among other things, doing a zillion good education technology. She's a brilliant person, wonderful networker, something you absolutely need to know. And, 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 and she runs a great website if you're interested in learning spaces. So if you're thinking about the commons, if you're thinking about how you your library, you're thinking about creating a lab, you're changing your classrooms up, Flex is from my money the best place in the world to see examples, to see research, to see resources, and to connect with people. Flex is just astonishing. Now, years ago, we hosted these to introduce Flex And I'm so happy to have her come back and update us to see what's going on. So first, before I bring my other colleague on the stage, let me just ask Lisa, hello, how is your presentation of FlexSpace going here today? What do you have to tell us about that? What's oh, the I, I would like to tell everyone that this is a freely available resource. If you have a .edu account, please share your learning spaces uh, at FlexSpace.org. You can go in, create an account, and people are using FlexSpace to get all sorts of ideas. And this stranger next to me. Yeah, this, this guy with this little this facial hair problem. Is, is Joe from UCLA and also the chairman of the board of the Higher Education Technology and Managers Alliance. So we, we um, are working together to grow FlexSpace even bigger. And then and the, the other thing I would like to say is I'm always astounded at the generosity of our colleagues who share not only their learning spaces, but also upload all kinds of helpful, as my, my, my uh, partner Rebecca likes to say, quick hacks. Yes, yes. <laughs> easy, easy to do things, yeah. um, research tools, all sorts of cool stuff, a lot about inclusion, diversity, good Excellent. stuff. Excellent. I'm well, Joe, Joe, in all seriousness, welcome. I'm glad to see you. You're here from UCLA. I'm here from UCLA, so I'm the executive director of Digital Spaces uh, as my, my nine to five, uh, which is That's really exciting. I know it's, it's the greatest title ever. ever. Work. It tells you nothing about what I do. <laughs> it, it is fantastic. No, no. Uh, and really, what it is is it was actually a role created in order to really rethink how we use our spaces because we know the classrooms and learning environments are no longer just four walls and a chalkboard, right? right? We now live this new world, this hybrid world, the high flex world. I don't know, throw the buzzwords out. And, and how can we now leverage that and push that forward? Right. right. And that's really what my job was created. So I've been there for uh, this is week five. So so, so far, you know, you know, it is fantastic. Well, I was going to tease you and say that you got to leave UCLA to enjoy a touch of what cold weather is like. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, it was 92 degrees the day before I got on a plane. That's right. Um, the suffering and the struggle is real. Yeah. yeah. But you're also called the director of digital learning spaces. Digital, digital space. So how does the digital play a role there? You know, you know it really, every, all of what we do now lives in this weird virtual hybrid world, right? So the idea is how can we 
connect all of our spaces? How can we connect students to make this seamless experience across the enterprise? One of the interesting things about my new role is it's not just classrooms. That's only 20%. We have everything from our, our signage to our conference rooms, to our group study rooms, to our libraries, to our conferences and events, to our housing, uh, all of those things. And really, we take the student and we look at who the student is. They're a mobile first uh, person right now. And they're known by their identity. You know, a fun fact is the average uh, 13 to 25 year old is known better by their Instagram handle than they are their own first name. And, and so, so now, I just, I just want to hear that thought again, that their Instagram handle is more, is more known than their, their own first name. And a, a social media influencer is the number one highest revenue job for, for the 13 to 25 next to sports. So therefore, uh, if you realize that this branding, a student now is their own brand. And that is exactly now what we're trying to do and what we're doing at UCLA is say, can we leverage that? Can we leverage this new demographic? And can we take our spaces, whatever they're doing, and take the technology and make it work for them? Because we know students now, um, you know, one of the things, call it good or bad, I won't make a judgment, but it's true, is, you know, we learned during the pandemic, you don't have to learn just by sitting in a class and being lectured to, right? And now students want to keep that going. They're saying, hey, you know what, if we're all going to take the same 100 level class, can we just meet at Starbucks, have our coffee, collaborate together and use, going out for a very long answer to your very short question, can we now go and say, and say, can we use digital tools, uh, virtual uh, whiteboarding? Can we use collaboration tools? Can we do all those types of things to work together no matter where we are and where we want to learn from? And, then and, and interestingly, uh, the, the founding people for Flexspace, all of our advisors, many of our, our sponsors and supporters, said from the beginning, this needs to be bigger than just built learning environments. You know, we need to be sharing more about the digital learning environments. So even though we're kind of a, a physical built environment, it's rapidly expanding to all sorts of other cool stuff. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about so many things about what you just said, Joe, and, and about what you're describing Flexspace. Uh, but if I could, what kind of feedback have you gotten from here at Educos? Uh, what, have, what questions have people put to the two of you when you talk about this? Um, what issues do they bring to you? Well, from the Flexspace perspective, we are unveiling a brand new platform, and we're pretty excited about that. Um, just, just a couple, couple of the key differences, key features, mm -hmm. people are going to be able to communicate, mm -hmm. communicate at the record, record level. So, so if you have a question about, about a particular space, so you can reach out, out and speak to the person who uploaded it. Or if somebody else is, is, is looking, they'll be able to perhaps answer a question. question. Um, and the idea of course, it's kind of like our Pinterest on steroids for learning spaces, every individual user will be able to create their own idea boards and share them. So oh. it's no longer limited to just administrators. Oh, good. I would totally use that. And, and the bonus is fully mobile. So, so when they will be able to go into a learning space, take the pictures, we have, um, in fact, we have a brain in a few minutes, so mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about the flip of the flex space and the planning pathway where we, we use, it's a sample, uh, where we use the, the Educause Learning Space Training System to help campus advisors understand what the learning potential is in their various rooms on campus. And then we get them all together around the table, because they've got some data to work with, and get them into flex space to start looking at whole rooms. Because we're, we're in 75 different countries now. There's some cool spaces in there. Yeah. Belgium, Japan, Australia, Canada. Yes, certainly oh. Australia. That would be awesome. So that sounds terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and Joe, I'm curious, what have you heard? Uh, yeah, from you your know, perspective? echoing that. One of the great things, because obviously we're unveiling this week the. Um, you know, the dating, the merging, the mm -hmm. collaboration of FlexSpace into HEDMA, the Higher Education Technology Management Alliance, HEDMA.org. 
Um, yeah, and we have, have uh, uh, yeah, an opportunity to do a commercial, a commercial. commercial. No. I was just going to ask you for the URL. So, so you know, it's actually a great community. community. We're an advocacy organization, actually only uh, four years old, but we have a few thousand members now, 750 institutions. Uh, our our list serve of over 30,000, um, which is crazy. Um, but it really it was founded in order to give a, a community for technology managers in their, in, in their learning environments. And I was always always a fan of FlexSpace from day one. Ever since I had, I was brought into higher ed uh, from live events, and I kind of came in and said, "Hey, where? Um, how do I even start designing a classroom?" And FlexSpace was the answer. So there's been this like this friendship all along that turned into a wait. Now we have this new 3.0 platform. We started now we need the community with it. So bringing, bringing the community with, with the tool, I think, I think is going to be huge. And it, it will always be free. And it'll bring this together, together and leverage great uh, great partners, partners in the industry are going to allow that to happen. happen. So, so anybody at any, any institution who's looking, looking to, to be able, able to create a space, use a space, be effective with a space, will be able to go here, start to be like to me the exciting part of the idea of words. I love it. I love that now we can work through the process and then collaborate the whole process while well, well, building up the people who are the ones who end up using it and supporting it. It's productive it's social media. Very 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 much. Much. Oh, this sounds, this sounds yeah. excellent. Did you give us the URL for Flexspace again? Flexspace.org. There you go. We're very excited to be working with our development team that came all the way from the project because everybody is essentially a mini administrator. So um, that's we're, we're very anxious to share what we've got like with our friends, friends. and we need to go to a more great day. day. Well, I don't want to keep you from that. I do want to say in the chat, uh, uh, Tom Himmons mentioned designing a whole campus around third spaces. And he shares a link for that. So you should definitely oh, check that out. Thank you, Tom. Tom. Yeah. Well, so, thank you both. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. Thanks for letting me crash your party. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> Heck, <laughs> <Lord>. <laughs> at Flexspace. Wonderful to see both of you. Thank you so much. Happy brain day. And uh, everybody, uh, we would, of course, be happy to hear any of your questions about the conference. Uh, we'd love to hear any of your thoughts, anything you'd like to talk about. And uh, in the meantime, there are a few people here who could possibly join us. We have all kinds of folks, including, I mentioned, uh, Niger Nam, if you haven't actually have a representative here. Uh, and uh, while we wait to see people, um, so, uh, you can ask us at least a few questions. Um, can I put you on the stage? Uh, can I just move this over here? Just oh, you want to see oh, you want me to get over there? Yeah, why don't you get over there? Okay. I'm talking to an invisible person, right? This is often a sign of some kind of early onset mental illness. But instead, I'm talking to my good friend, Jerry Bain. Uh, Jerry is a multimedia master. Uh, he is based in Illinois, excuse me, Indiana. I keep thinking yeah. here. Um, and he is, among other things, the uh, media, what's it, what's it called? multimedia Multimedia program manager for Educos. So for years, he's been doing interviews, he's been doing podcasts, he's been doing videos, and he's just a terrific at this, and uh, he's been a great host. Um, and so I want to first thank him, but also to say, um, but also to say, um, what have you been hearing uh, as you've been talking to people? You've been doing interviews. You are here, right here in this space. You get to have people walk by and ask you questions. Uh, what's what's your sense of the vibe? What's the Edge Conference telling you right now? Oh, that's a good question. I'm sort of a little bit um, removed from the conference, even though we're right here on the on the, uh, the courseway here, because I have my little studio here, and I just get visitors from the conference. Um, I did a very interesting interview uh, just this afternoon with somebody. Pega Parsi, I don't know if you've heard. She's the uh, chief privacy officer for. I have to look it up because it's escaping me. She is the chief privacy officer for uh, UC San Diego, and we talked a lot about uh, privacy in regards to vendor relationships, and uh, that was a very interesting conversation. I very much encourage people to check out her post or her session, um, it gives a very um, comprehensive view of privacy 
one that's much more expanded than, than what we think of. Her, the thrust of her argument is we think of uh, we think of privacy in very narrow terms, mm-hmm. and it encompasses so much more, especially in the digital realm, that people don't think of. Um, and that the vendor and private industry uh, is talking sort of a different language of privacy than academia. Mm-hmm. That was interesting. Um, that's 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 I uh, you know, I'm the sort of person where you put me on the spot if you have a trouble blank. Oh, you're, you're great. That was that, that was a very rich blank that you just drew for us. But it's interesting that you say that because it, it kind of it reminds me of what uh, Joe was just saying a few minutes ago that this is a generation that rises where social media is so crucial to what they do. Uh, and, you know, the, the one line about someone's you know, Instagram handle being more famous than their own yeah. name, right? Um, how does that, do you think, jive with this problem of privacy? That's a good question. Um, I, I that's just so not my expertise. I, I wouldn't know. I, I do know that um, you know that we're being bought and sold, bought and sold as profiles to different industries. So you know there may be a Brian Alexander out there that's uh, yeah that's a different Brian Alexander than this other industry has. So we have many personalities, um, and I think that's that's happening more and more. And, you know, people don't, people are still, you know, even though we're pretty far into the digital age, we're still young enough that people are just now starting to grasp that. that there are personas that have developed out there that they don't even maybe know about that have been drafted from what they bought here, who they talked to there. You know, what does that mean? That's a fantastic way of describing it. It reminds me a bit of personas and design thinking. Yeah, we're, um, but think that we have uh, doppelgangers running around. Um, constructed of us um, that are similar but different in some key ways. Right. So, so maybe for one week you're looking for a watch for your wife or yeah, yeah. You, want a, you want a vintage watch, you want an old watch. So suddenly there's a profile of you out there that's very interested in watches, even though two weeks later you're not that person anymore. But that profile lives on somewhere. I'll tell you, I gave a, um, I, I wrote about, uh, this is some time ago, about 12 years ago, about giving up caffeine and giving up alcohol on the same day, uh, and also giving up spices. So it was a serious move. And I posted about it on Facebook. Yeah, I can tell you about the spot. But the key thing was, I started getting served up ads for substance abuse, uh, you know, Al-Anon and, and everything else. I was like, no, I don't, I don't need this. It, it, I was kind of charmed by it. You know, it's like Facebook is caring about me. You know, but they weren't. But, but so there's there's a person of me that's going out that has these issues, right? Uh, what happened? Is that persona now gone? Because it was a while ago. Uh, you know, it's uh, that's a fascinating thing. Could I ask you a couple questions about your presentation? What See, now we're, we're turning the table, right? Yes, you know, what I do, and, and this is great. So. You, you've talked about artificial intelligence, and I've been thinking about them. These are fairly obvious questions, but I'd love to hear you talk about. Do you think, uh, how do you evaluate it as a threat versus a promise? Every industry that is, is disrupted, there are people that are going to not have jobs. If we want to go uh, clean energy, there's going to be people that are disrupted out of the coal industry. Yeah. yeah. If we, but yeah. AI seems to be dis- able to disrupt several industries at once. Um, Remote cars, cars driving by themselves, creative, creative stuff. Oh yeah, let's bring someone else in. What do you think of that? How, do, you, do, you, do you think there's going to be a lot of pain before you really see the promise of AI, or will they happen at the same time? Um, I think pain is the order of the day. Uh, so to back up a little bit, uh, today is Wednesday. On Monday, I gave a, a pre-conference workshop um, about uh, AI, generative AI in higher education, uh, and it was a very exciting event. We had lots and lots of people, lots of conversation, and, and this came up. A lot of anxiety were there, uh, wondering about where things were headed. And I, I think, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, that we have, I, I think there's, there's the possibility that we're moving to a ubiquitous AI future in the near term. And, and this is one that what we're experiencing now may be interstitial. In fact, one of the things that came up uh, was that uh, while we have tools like ChatGPT or MidJourney or Pi, that those might be really interstitial because the way most people are going to experience AI is through the tools they're more used to. Uh, so Photoshop right now, for example, has AI built in. Lots of people use Photoshop just for everyday life. And of course, Google Docs, you know, all the you know, Google, uh, Google Docs, Google Slides, Google, uh, what's the Excel spreadsheet for Google? 
called uh, Google Sheets, Google Sheets right? right? So all of those have AI built in, and uh, and you can then, you know, that may be where we end up being. Uh, can I ask you one last question? Oh, no, 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 I'm not just answering it, but oh, this is a great question. <laughs> no, uh, so so I, I think in many ways the pain is, some of them are the pains of this transition. Some of them are caused by some of the proponents of AI who are doing the old move fast and break things kind of school. Uh, and some of it's, uh, it's caused by just the sheer complexity of modern civilization into which we're jamming this immensely complicated technology. Uh, it's also technology that's moving super quickly, changing on, on a weekly basis and a daily basis at times. Uh, and that that just adds the complexity, adds the friction, um, and that's not even getting dystopian. Uh, so I think that's that's a quick answer to your question. Can I ask one more question? I know we need to move on to talk to this fine sure. gentleman right here. Um, do you think this move and development in AI in all fronts? Uh, we've got some creative tools like Midjourney, yeah, uh, yeah. ChatGPT to, to do some creative things as well. That taken into consideration as well as all the other things. Um, do you think the progression of AI will have any effect on the humanities? Um, the humanities have been suffering for several years. Uh, people are, this is my, this may be inaccurate, but I sense that people have been moving more towards academia for job related things, science, science related things, industry related yeah. things. The idea of the humanities as a um, profitable or encouraged uh, pursuit has dwindled a little bit, dwindled a lot. and I wonder if do you think AI will have any impact on that, uh, to positive or negative? I think it will have a huge impact at a few different levels, uh, and one of them is the, the context is that enrollment in the humanities has been dropping steadily, uh, more so in some fields than others. Languages other than uh, English, for example, is really steep. I think religion is going to continue to drop, especially as religious belief in the U.S. continues to drop. Uh, my own field where I came from, English, has been you know, dropping as well. Uh, history is, is doing poorly. Uh, so I think it depends on how we react within the humanities and how the rest of the world perceives uh, AI. So, for example, if we think about AI, generative AI is an artistic and creative tool. This helps us communicate, this helps us write, this helps us draw. Then we might see some help as people go to an art class and they say, yeah, okay, I want to learn paintbrush, I want to learn photography. I also want to figure out how to make mid-journey really dance and say, uh, you may have someone in a journalism class who says, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm good at writing here, but I also want to know, I'm going to get hired by the Chicago Sun Times, right? I'm just making this up now. Uh, and if they may be having AI built into our internal content management system. I want to know how to work with it. Uh, so that's one possibility. It's also possible that uh, we make it experimental because if you take a look at some of these questions, what does it mean to write with ChatGPT? This is the kind of question that people in literary criticism are wrestling with for hundreds of years. What is a creator? What does it mean to remix things? And we have a lot to say unless we drop the ball, unless we don't engage, which is, I'm afraid, also possible. It feels like we're becoming more editors than originators. You no, are good say. at this. You said you were drawing a blank. You just drew a wonderful <laughs> phrase. We are editors, not originators. I, you know, there's a great documentarian, Errol Morris. A wonderful, wonderful guy. He did oh, yeah. uh, Thin Blue Line, for example. It's a wonderful documentary. Fog of War. Fog of War. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and a movie about Rumsfeld. It's yeah. the only time I've seen him on screen and actually lose his temper. Right, but, right. But, uh, but he, I, I asked him what we're doing with him. I said, what does the digital world do for filmmaking? And he really surprised me. He said, you don't need to shoot video anymore. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, well, think about it. There's so much video content available that you can make a movie right now by remix. And he cited the great British documentarian, Adam Curtis, whose work is nothing but remixed pre-original video that he arranges and then speaks over. And they're powerful. Uh, I don't know if Morris is completely right in that, but it blew me away. We're editors. That may be where we go. Uh, friends, everything is happening at the Educause Conference. We're going everything from very technical details to deep philosophical and structural questions. Now, I'd like to welcome another guest. Uh, and this is a friend who is in my line of work. He's a futurist, and he also works with EAB. Uh, and this 
his head. Uh, and then it's, I always want to put an L in there. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, yeah, for, uh, for a five letter last name, it gets uh, mangled in so many different ways. So I've been sure my whole life. Yeah, I mean, Smith works, right? Uh, Jones works. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm, only, uh, I'm very grateful to Ed Bennett for buying me so many beers of ours, uh, noisy bars over the years. That's been, uh, been a great benefit. So uh, you appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so if I could add in something to the conversation just to conclude. Um, uh, composers. Uh, AI engineer I mean, for, music. for music, yes. Um, so you can imagine the AI generated music. Absolutely. And it is now about what, what kind, kind of songs do you want to put in there? Definitely. To generate there's a, music. there's a, an academic in Ohio, and I'm sorry I don't have his name, um, but he had built a generating baroque music tool. And it basically it generates what sounds like Bach or Vivaldi coming from the next room. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's pretty convincing, if, unless, unless you're a deep, deep expert in 17th century music. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty surprising, surprising but, um, but this, this is a good point. point. Uh, well, we were, we were just, just now, just before, before we started, we started talking about uh, the Apple uh, tool of uh, Garage, which, which comes with so many pre existing clips, and you can make a lot of stuff just by shuffling it around. So, Ed, what do you, what do you, first of all, what do you do at AMB? Oh, and and what, do you, what, do you, what did you do here at EduCos? Well, um, I'll give you a little bit of background or give the audience a little bit of background here. Uh, I've been here for about 16 years. My background is in the ground floor. Wow. Uh, my background is in evolutionary biology. biology. So, I uh, studied so change over time, uh, my whole life, uh, in spite of my interest in futurism. Uh, my time at EAB has been devoted to student success. So looking at the different ways that we can support students, particularly through technology, mm -hmm. uh, in our case, a CRM analytics technology, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. navigating to our official or two, uh, and using it to essentially connect students to services, be they advising you, be they mental health services, academic support, career advising, you name it. Um, and uh, my colleague, uh, Kathy Shaw, presented some data yesterday that showed just how far the gap is most schools have all these services available. Only about half the students are aware of the services available at their school, and only about 20% of them are using it. Oh, no. But those that use it feel a sense of belonging, are more likely to stick around, and be retained. So we have a market involvement, if you will. Or a Yeah, something along those lines. There's some gap there. Yeah. It's just the schools are already spending money on this stuff. It's an actually very encouraging thing for me to look at and say, look, you don't have to make big new investments here. You've got the stuff you need. You need to promote it better yeah, in some ways. And that's going to be involved in changing the polarity from students come to us to we go to them. And perhaps AI has a, uh, an opportunity in there as well. I've been hearing more and more about student services at you know, EDUCAUSE this time. You know, everything from student data and using it to better shape services. Um, what have you been? What have you been saying here at EDUCAUSE? Yeah. What have you been hearing at EDUCAUSE? Well, um, so uh, I had a conversation yesterday about uh, the fragmented data architecture uh, around campus and how you might have 20 different databases. You did the LMS, the SIS, or whatever you've got around admissions data, yeah. HR data, that all could be drawn from uh, to apply to many problems, including student success. Uh, I'm particularly interested in math. I hope we can talk about that for a minute. About which math? Uh, the, you know, how much math do students know? Sorry, I thought you were saying an acronym for a second there. Okay. No, no, math, math. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, how would you get a sense of where your first year class is? On their math preparation, a world where you don't rely on test scores so much now. Good point. You could pull information from so many databases around campus, but unless you have good data governance, you can't. And so, you know, that leads to a good point. I think the edge of top end this morning put into that in a number of different ways. Um, as far as the, what I've been learning from the conference, uh, I've been asking a lot of questions that are like, well, where do you see the future going? You know, especially for success. Universe. Every single person I talk to is not about a half a dozen conversations like this runs right to the same phrase, and they say the same phrase, perception of value. Are we doing anything good here? How do we know about it? And then does the public, meaning our students, let's go ahead and call them customers, feel that they want to invest the time and money in the product that we provide? I had a fascinating conversation last night uh, where we developed an analogy, which was, well, it's a university or a college. It's a genius for the mind. It's, it's an opportunity to spend two to four years, or however long you're going to be in. Some of us have been, you know, for your grad school for a long time, but it's a motor. Really just exercising mm -hmm. our ability to think 
Um, and combine that with the often quoted, uh, we are preparing students for jobs that do not even exist right now. Right. How do you prepare a student for a job that you don't even know what that job is? Well, make sure all the brain. And whatever it is that will come our way, we will be able to deal with uh, in a more thoughtful manner. So this is interesting. You start off by talking about biology, but now you have entered the realm of communication. These are the first there's this interesting problem on campuses where they have all these great services and the word hasn't really gotten out yet. And now you're saying the higher education is doing this great brain gymnasium work, but we haven't really convinced the country about this. Yeah, yeah it's hard to talk about, right? Because uh, somehow we got pigeonholed in talking about earning yes, or yeah. you know, whatever the wage premium is yeah. on the degree. Uh, and then that naturally, Warnings that seem to you, okay, this is a business major, we don't make more money, this is a computer science major. And yes, all that, right? But what about the data that's out there right now that we say, uh, you know, at age 35, a liberal arts major begins to make more than a technical major? What happened now? Well, think about the gymnasium analogy. They, they got to move between different skills, they got to jump between different machines. You know, they shot boots and they lifted weights and they tried to balance beam. Sure. And when they leave, they can take a job at the balance beam. And then maybe later they can get a job at the basketball business. Yeah. And now we'll go ahead and say, as a, as a STEM major myself, human management majors make better managers. They understand their people better. That's part of the training. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So if you were telling the public this sort of stuff, listen, yes, 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 yes. At age 25, you'll make more money if you are in these fields that the public believes. But and then you're not across the course of your career necessarily, unless you go to business school, go to law school, or whatever, and get some additional training on top of your technical major. Maybe you're a real powerhouse. Um, but we're terrible at talking about that sort of stuff and communicating in that way. We need to get better at that. We do, especially because we're now moving into a future with fewer available Gen Z students. Or just fewer of them. Fewer, fewer. Fewer than want to go to college. The participation rate of high school grads has been shrinking now for about 10 years, almost. Um, we get the pandemic there added in, and then we've got this math problem that I alluded to a minute ago. It's been really bad. If you look at the NAEP scores uh, of what is going on in K-12 right now in terms of preparation levels, it's not great. Um, if we had something like, you know, called maybe 45% of our eighth graders in the past on a college level track for math, um, meaning not that they didn't call it math in eighth grade, but they're on the trajectory, right, right, right. that's not 35%. And, and so, so in about three to four years, wow, yeah. So, so, in about, so we've lost wow. one in eight, one in seven of the students that we have a brutal population. That is a crisis right there. So, so we, we have, have a thing to do here. Because yeah. you can imagine how math touches so many different programs. Yeah. Um, we'll we have to change the criteria. Will schools, schools that have not had developmental education, education programs of scale, so that when we have scale, if you are a fancy school that is all the best students, mm -hmm. what happens to your faculty when they start seeing that their, their preparation in the classroom isn't really there? Uh, this, this is fantastic. Are, are you are you going to be on the on the vendor floor? Um, yes, yes, I'll absolutely be out there um, um, from about 3 p.m. on today. today. I was planning on meeting up at the Turns Out the Fish for an AI presentation tomorrow. Oh, good. So, so if you're around at 9 30 tomorrow morning, you can come see the AI. Okay, so it's 9 30 tomorrow morning to AI. But right now, where is the EAB? Do you remember your number on the floor? That's 919. Okay, so the 900 are on. Yeah, yeah. So either come see you or any of my colleagues, we have to talk about either data companies. That sounds that's great. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, a real pleasure. And, uh, and you can stick around for a few minutes if you want to. We're going we're gonna to push the monitor over here to bring back one of our dear friends and uh, a repeat serial guest, in fact. Uh, let me introduce Maya Goryeva. Everybody knows Maya. Uh, I mean, I've always introduced her as the person who, along with her uh, co-conspirator, Emory Craig, are the world's great experts in how higher education engages with extended reality, with virtual reality, with augmented reality. But over the past couple of years, not content just to have that, Maya has moved on to become an expert and a leader in two other fields. She's been working a lot on quantum computing, winning awards and winning grants, and she's working in AI. Uh, she is a one woman machine, an army of brain in this one person. And she does this all with aplomb, brilliance, and being very, very kind at the same time. So first of all, I just want to say welcome. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You. It's a real treat. Um, I know I see a lot of you online, and I also want to say hello to some of the friends I see on the session. But it's a real treat to see you, Brian, in person. And it's um, it's a great it's a great week in Chicago. So yeah, at Edibles. 
But let me ask. We just put these big topics in this feed. Those are three topics, each of which is enormous. You know, AI, quantum computing, and XR. Which of those have you been working on here at Educos? Which of those are you presenting, talking about? Which of these would you like to talk about right now? All right. So for me, it's, it's actually the, the way I like to think about this is frontier technologies. And the way I would like to think about this convergence. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really the convergence of those that make sense of them and also make them such a force multiplier, mm -hmm. which is what we're seeing, mm -hmm. and it will have a, you know, a, a significant impact. Um, but here at Educause, uh, yesterday I spoke about the Innovation Center, which is my playground, the Innovation Center, and the new school has three labs, and that's the XR lab, the AI lab, and the quantum labs. And under these labs, we actually, the reason they exist is in a way uh, to create a track, a launch pad for these opportunities um, at the new school, and some of it recognizes also as the first school of design. So under these, we engage with curricular, extracurricular partnerships, things like hackathons, design jams, empowering students. Um, in these and under these three labs, so yesterday we spoke about that, about just creating this ecosystem. For me, it's really um, a playground and launch pad for me, students and faculty. And really creating an opportunity to think about emerging technologies in the context of uh, all the different backgrounds, programs that exist at the new school. It's a lot of complexity. Yes. Um, but, but tomorrow, tomorrow morning, um, I will get to do a critical conversation with, yes, my co conspirator, Emery Craig, on um, the new ethical frontier, and that focuses on AI in higher education and society. And that will be something that this fall, in particular, we picked up an incredible pace at, at the new school um, in terms of how I engage with that conversations with faculty and students. So, as we spoke earlier this week, I've been mentioning we are running a series of events and workshops. Um, and we kind of try to put them in a long form and short form, and that's my thinking. And long form is these conversations that are beyond just a demonstration. It's really on the ethical and philosophical um, kind of questions and elements. And I think we, you know, bringing bringing a, bringing a little bit more of a movement and time and high level. Um, reflection, but also some of them are kind of need immediate conversation in higher education. And then on Tuesday, on Thursday, I get to bring my research assistant, and she actually uh, stands by me, and we go into things with the journey and stable diffusion, and uh, um, whatever else comes our way, Adobe and sound and video, and we, and it's a really kind of playful session, but we get into, hands-on into it, and so um, it's a real treat. Um, and uh, Julia is uh, just an amazing design and technology undergraduate student at Parsons. Oh, fantastic. Undergrad. Oh, we're looking forward to meeting Julia. Uh, uh, this sounds terrific. And I love the way that you're working at such a high level. And of course, Ed and I are both very delighted to see that such a futures oriented level. Thinking about how you can combine AI and quantum in order to, for example, power content creation and VR and XR. It's just terrific stuff. But what are you, what are you hearing from all the participants here at EduCause when you talk about this stuff? Uh, do they bring you projects they have in mind or questions or are they frightened? Or what kind of feedback do you get? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there are lots of good sessions and as usually it happens, the session provides a great, a great platform for the conversations that linger. And sort of the, le the level of engagement in the conversation post-session, I think, is just as um, being just as insightful and, and a good opportunity for me to, to kind of get into um, more of the uh, deeper questions. I think today, right, we're in a space where a lot of people are still learning. And I think it's good to be in a learning mode. Uh, and if you think you know what's happening, then I would caution that. <laughs> because uh, first of all, it's going with rapid space, space around us. Um, and also, we're just scratching the surface, right? We, um, I mean, we have a lot of institutions have brought in things like chatbots and other things, and we have some awareness how to run this, and they serve good, good purpose um, in in, a, in addressing some questions. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of conversation, lots of conversation about ChatGPT um, and um, academic integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and rightly so, here at Agicos, lots of people um, behind at home are uh, in charge of, of running some of these services. Um, so very, I think, a very 
and a question around um, academic, very strong trend around this conversation, what we make of this. I think still um, looking at what are the other opportunities, um, and I think it's very uneven in, until and how we how we think about that um, across our programs. Um, so I think there's some conversation and also how we prepare our fan Fuji staff to engage with that, um, whether it's in professional development or in the classroom. So nothing as much as deeper level. I think that this is, there's an awareness that needs to happen. But of course, this project is just happening. They're right now happening. So what I see a lot more is um, a, a bit like on that level, just communicating. Um, we need to do this and this is what we're doing. I think we will know uh, even even in institutions, and we did the same thing, we ran similar things in the spring, it's still like, I think the reflection point is is much more on on doing things and, and running things and, and less so, uh, no, I, um, I guess, um, you know, communicating results, but that's, that's like, that's, that's akin for the moment. This is, this is fascinating. Um, I, I think what, one of the things I've been hearing from where you took that answer uh, is something that we were just hearing from Ed, and also that we heard earlier from Tom, and that we also heard from Joe and from Lisa, how much of this question of technology, it, it's easy to say it's a human question, but I think operationally, so much of this is about changing institutions so that they can apprehend and acculturate these technologies and how they change the institutions at the level of communication, at the level of restructuring offices, departments, curricula, and then sharing all this information out in order to partly become more creative, become more just, become more efficient, to better adapt to the future changing all around us. And also, I'm thinking of your, of your student, of Yulia, to help make that future happen. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, and we are at the end of the hour. We have to wrap things up. Um, we just heard from uh, several people about where to find them here. Maya, where can we find you at the conference? So at the conference, tomorrow morning, Thursday, at 9.45 a.m., um, it's actually in the central co concourse level, right next to the booth and right next to the entrance. It's an open session. It's going to be right here, actually publicly and available. Stop by. Um, and uh, yeah, and we will be bringing what I think will be a, a, an event and a series of conversations that have taken place this this week to to a moment of um, really thinking um, in that what happens in that next frontier, mm -hmm. how do we evolve? Uh, because the, the question is not, it, it is really about that transformation. We've been talking about for, Ed, for the last two decades before you and me been in this conversation for a long time. Um, but at this point, um, we have no time left. If we wanna, if we actually wanna make sure that our students um, are really engaging with us, that our institutions are going to be successful, um, it, the time is now. Exactly. What a great moment to end up. And uh, I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but everybody else should be, so they can go see your session, Maya. Um, Maya, Ed, thank you both so much. It's been great having you here. Uh, I have to wrap things up right now. Uh, I'm going to close that tab just so that uh, um, it'll, uh, uh, it'll end that, that uh, video despite. Um, Thank everybody uh, for being here. Before I can say thank you, I want to mention one more thing. Uh, this is from one guest, uh, uh, Eric, uh, who uh, managed to share this thought. Just a comment, library consortium staff here, my executive director leans on Educon's reports as an invaluable source for landscape review, even at Burns Eye consortium point of view. So thanks to all, or thanks is all. And I hear that, Eric. Uh, this is really, really important research. And I'm glad that we can share some of this work with all of you. Uh, online. Uh, I'm really grateful to Educause for giving us this hour to uh, to play in the studio. I'm grateful to Jerry and to uh, uh, and to his colleague Zorab uh, for doing all kinds of work, uh, making sure all this functions. I'm grateful to all of you uh, online for putting questions to us, for thinking, and for uh, putting work together. Uh, now, a couple of things about looking ahead a bit. Uh, just to remind you that the forum is continuing. If you'd like to dis continue discussing these issues, be it the human way of apprehending and acculturating all the technologies or ways of communicating or ways of doing learning spaces, we can keep talking about this. Just use the hashtag FTTE wherever you are. Here is me on Twitter, on Mastodon, on Threads, on Blue Sky, and of course my blog. So wherever you are in the socials, I think we can find you. 
uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, which cover all these topics, including a couple of these folks as guests, uh, like Maya and Lisa, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, looking ahead, we have sessions on information literacy, intermediary institutions, and the changing landscape of online education. And thank you all for being with us for this extraordinary live session. Thanks, everybody, for contributing. Thanks to my guests who I pulled off the street to talk. Um, we'll see you next time online. Be safe and be well, everybody. Bye-bye.